really important. Gina McCarthy, the White House National Climate Advisor, will join us in just a moment. Then I'll share a virtual stage with Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan to discuss the great strides her state is making to lift up electric vehicle infrastructure. Sam Ricketts, our senior fellow here at the Center for American Progress, will then moderate a conversation with our fascinating and really powerful panel. But first, let me just do a little bit of table setting about the moment that we arrived at. President Biden entered the White House with an unprecedented plan to rewrite and reinvigorate the roadmap to a clean energy future. Since then, we've seen this administration commit to net zero emissions by 2050, a Justice 40 initiative that ensures at least 40% of the overall federal investments in climate and clean energy go to disadvantaged communities, and the 30 by 30 initiative, which seeks to preserve 30% of our lands and oceans by 2030. Last year, the president also signed into law a unprecedented bipartisan infrastructure law, the largest infrastructure bill in the history of our nation. This bill goes a long way toward ensuring that clean energy future goes hand in hand with revitalizing our infrastructure and creating high quality jobs. As part of those investments, billions were set aside for a carbon reduction program to fund energy efficient transportation projects, billions more for building out pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, for upgrading the electric grid and to make it more resilient. And that's not to mention the $5 billion set aside for electric vehicles and a further 2.5 billion for charging infrastructure. These investments taken together give states the opportunity to make good on their promises of a clean energy economy and with it attract businesses and support well-paying union workforce. Gina McCarthy has been at the heart of orchestrating these efforts. She centered this administration's climate work as not only an energy and environmental issue, but as a jobs issue and an economic issue, and one that impacts families across this country. Gina previously served as the president and CEO of the National Resources Defense Council and as the head of the EPA during President Obama's uh, administration. We could not have a stronger champion on these issues uh, or a better public servant than Gina McCarthy. Gina, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, I turn it over to you now. Hey, Patrick, thank you so much. And it's really wonderful to be part of this event. And I'm so glad that the Center for American Progress is really bringing us all together to discuss the opportunities that we have in the transportation sector. You know, the great state of Michigan is at the forefront of these opportunities, thanks to the leadership of Governor Whitmer. And I'm so honored to be with her on this call. And I want all of you to know that you should be thanking her and her team for delivering such tremendous opportunities. You know, before we hear from the governor, I want to just make it clear that I, to give you a quick overview of how President Biden is actually moving forward to help states like Michigan so that governors like Governor Whitmer can really move further and faster towards a clean transportation future. And we're seeing it happen. Look, since day one, President Biden has been delivering on his commitment to tackle the climate crisis with the urgency that science demands. He created our first ever National Climate Task Force so that every cabinet secretary now has climate as part of their agency's mission. And they use every tool available to achieve our climate goals like reducing U.S. emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in 2030, which will require significant shifts in the transportation sector, which, as you know, is the largest source of emissions. But it's also where huge opportunities abound if we open them up, not just to reduce emissions, but to grow good paying union jobs. Yes, right here in Michigan and beyond. 
You know, just last year, President Biden rallied the automakers and the United Auto Workers around a national target of getting to 50 percent electric vehicle sales in 2030. And because of that vision and commitment from President Biden, we have seen companies announce investments of over, are you ready, $100 billion in American EV manufacturing. And that's going to create, as I said before, good paying union jobs in Michigan and across the country. So we need to get excited about capturing these opportunities. And to accelerate our EV future, we also set the strongest ever passenger vehicle standards so that we could not just reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also improve local air quality and increase fuel economy to an average of 49 miles per gallon, which will save drivers money at the pump. And as we continue to make progress at the federal level, we're going to keep using everything from our procurement power to the innovation happening in our national labs so that we can be delivering historic resources to help states like Michigan advance solutions that strengthen their economy and give their communities, both urban and rural, investments that make a real difference to families everywhere. You know, after decades of talk in Washington about investing in modern infrastructure, well, President Biden finally actually got that progress done. And through the bipartisan infrastructure law, he secured huge down payments of many of our climate and environmental justice priorities. For example, the law provides $7.5 billion for national EV charging network. And we're rolling out this funding through a new joint office with the Department of Transportation and Energy, joining together to work with states to make sure that they have sound deployment plans. We're also investing $7 billion to make more batteries right here in the United States of America. Earlier this month, we made available $3 billion to support jobs in battery manufacturing, processing, and exciting new work and recycling. We also made our largest investment ever in improving public transit, including support for making our transit infrastructure more resilient against extreme weather. And through a $6.7 billion carbon reduction program, states now have the resources that they need to advance everything from public transit projects to pedestrian and biking infrastructure. Look, we all know that clean transportation isn't just about combating climate change. It's also about building a better quality of life and healthier communities where families get to save money. You know, a great example of this is how we're investing in clean school buses to protect the health of our kids in our neighborhoods. Just the other day, Vice President Harris announced that school districts can now apply for the first $500 million from a $5 billion program to replace those dirty diesel buses with electric and low emission models, especially in communities that have long been overburdened by pollution. That means more money that will go to our schools because this saves money in the long run on fuels, as well as saves lives to those communities. You know, that announcement is part of our Justice 40 Week of Action, which is this week when we're highlighting the steps that we're delivering on President Biden's commitment that at least 40 percent of the benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy are going to go to disadvantaged communities. Why? Because they need it the most. And part of that commitment is making sure communities can access the historic resources in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is why we've launched a new technical assistance guide as a one stop shop for state, federal and tribal governments. But even as the progress we've made is exciting, we cannot stop here. And we know that because there's so much more work to be done. That's why the president continues to call on Congress to deliver on clean energy investments, including tax credits to bring down the sticker price for EVs for working families. 
so that we can seize the opportunities right there in front of us at the in the great state of Michigan and beyond like making sure we invest in clean energy to ensure our long-term energy security as we reduce our dependent on fossil fuels and take away the ability of autocrats like Putin to weaponize fossil fuel dependency against us. Lower costs for families across America who will save at the gas pump and on their energy bills. More good paying union jobs as we make EVs and batteries at factories in Michigan and across America and ensuring a healthier and brighter future for all of us. Well, that's President Biden's vision and I know it's Governor Whitmer's vision too. So with all that, I'll turn it back to Patrick to introduce the amazing Michigan governor. Thank you so very much, uh, Gina. You're pretty amazing yourself. Uh, that was an extraordinary uh, summation of all that's been done uh, and a projection into the future of a vision that holds communities together uh, and builds up the resilience of our middle class by investing in infrastructure. Extraordinary, well done, We're, we are inspired. Uh, clearly, the challenges we face are immense. There's plenty of work that needs to be done and it's important that we have the resources necessary to meet the moment uh, and you've given us a sense uh, of how those meet resources are meeting uh, the challenges on the ground. Uh, there's nowhere uh, where those challenges are not more centered uh, and aren't better led uh, than uh, in Michigan. So we're gonna shift uh, our focus uh, to that one state uh, that's playing this critical role in the transition uh, to electric vehicles, uh, but is doing it by putting a sharp focus on well-paid uh, union jobs. Uh, this weekend, I had the, the honor, the privilege uh, to join uh, with uh, workers from across the country who gathered together uh, in Alabama to have a strategic uh, conversation about what it means uh, to meet this moment of uh, new uh, energy uh, in the future, to be less resilient on uh, the autocrats, as Gina said, but to do it uh, in a way that lifts up uh, worker agency, builds a uh, better workforce in plants like GM, Mercedes, and Volkswagen. The one thing that kept coming up as a, as a thread with these workers uh, is a sense that they need agency uh, at the table, agency at the factory floor. Uh, they were pushing back against a regiment of being underpaid and overwork, uh, and they were clear that dignity needed to be centered as an intentional outcome as we transition to renewable uh, energies. Uh, the conversation that I joined affirmed in me uh, the need to tackle climate change and usher in this new future uh, as a way that makes in a way that makes it clear that those workers are indeed indispensable to these fights. Michigan has always been a heartland of worker agency. Uh, ever since it put the world on wheels more than a century ago, Michigan has lifted up millions of Americans through organized labor in the automobile industry. In fact, the middle class in America was created in Michigan. Governor Whitmer has built off that legacy, ensuring that Michigan has all the resources available to be a rip-roaring heartland of electric vehicle manufacturing and one that centers well-paying jobs for Michigan workers. That's meant securing billions in investments to create and retain thousands of jobs, putting 110 million into electric vehicle charging infrastructure, courtesy of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and collaborating with four other states to create a network to charge electric vehicles. All this has laid the groundwork for good jobs and economic growth and for the creation of the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. This plan announced last month aims to generate 60% of the state's electricity from renewable sources by 2030 and support 2 million electric vehicles in the same time period. So you can see why we were eager to have a conversation with uh, Governor Whitmer. So Governor, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you for your extraordinary leadership uh, in this vital moment. Uh, and uh, just thank you for, for your boldness. So I'm gonna just jump in if I can, Governor, by uh, giving you the floor, but also by giving you uh, a question. I want our, our viewers, those in Michigan and across the country, to really be able to get a sense of your top priorities to reduce emissions and increase mobility options across the state, uh, and to have you connect that for all of them uh, with the economic case for climate action. Yeah, well, thank you, Patrick. I'm so happy to be here with you and with Gina. She's fantastic. And uh, I appreciate the work that that uh, the Center for American Progress is doing. 
is so crucial. You know, I think that the opportunity to talk about mobility and climate action, um, it's exciting because these are these two issues tie together so much the work that we're doing in Michigan to grow our economy, to create good paying jobs, to lower costs for people. Um, and I, you know, appreciate the Center for American Progress for the space that you've created for experts and elected officials and private sector leaders to work together to tackle these big challenges. None of us can do it alone. And that's why our work together is so, so critically important. Today, you know, I'm looking forward to talking a bit about how Michigan can be a model, diverse manufacturing state with divided government, but still trying, still getting things done. And I think that's, that's so crucial. And I'll tell you, um, as I think about our kids and, and how they are often leading the way in these spaces, their voices and curiosity and ingenuity is gonna help us accomplish our climate goals. And that's why I'm a climate optimist. Investing in infrastructure that works for all Michiganders from roads to trails is what's so crucial as we seek to reduce emissions and increase mobility options across our state. Advancing vehicle electrification for families and businesses and schools, reducing range anxiety um, through the deployment of chargers to support 2 million electric vehicles by 2030. Um, we've invested in state and federal resources, uh, utilized state and federal resources to deploy chargers and launching regional chart partnerships like Rev Midwest and the Lake Michigan EV circuit. We're working with our partners in our neighboring states. We also are lowering costs of the EVs for Michigan families. We've proposed a $2,500 state rebate to combine with the $7,500 federal incentive so we can knock $10,000 off of the price of a new EV. Um, so more people can participate as we're seeing this transition. Um, and we've invested state and federal resources to help businesses and schools transition their fleets as well. So our economic development um, is geared with a eye toward, uh, you know, making sure that we're, we're able to deploy resources quickly. We set up a bipartisan effort to create this fund in December so that Michigan could compete for and win big projects. We've already landed a massive investment from General Motors, a $7 billion investment, the largest in company history, building um, batteries so that we can continue to ensure that they're building EV pickups and um, battery cell plants. So we've launched also innovative partnerships to build out our infrastructure and deploy new technologies, including um, inductive charging and the CAV new project. And we're keeping Michigan competitive by focusing on not just transitioning um, the, the industry, but planning. How do we have worker retraining? How do we have uh, competitive talent? So these are all important components to making sure that as we're building this out, we're sustaining good paying jobs um, and so that more people can participate. That's, that's really inspired, uh, Governor. Um, you, you said so much just then. Uh, but I'm going to, if I can, go back to uh, the inception of your plan and your vision. We all recognize that there's not a single state that can uh, tackle climate change alone. We know solutions. We need solutions that go beyond state lines, beyond party lines, beyond national lines. Uh, I noted the coming together of four different states that launched uh, this initiative, and you played a critical role in that. Can you help our audience understand how it is that you and your counterparts in Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, uh, and Wisconsin all joined forces to form the Regional Electric Vehicle Midwest Coalition, how you did it, uh, and what it means in terms of uh, serving as a model uh, for the future at a time when, uh, to be candid, we haven't been able to make the kind of progress that we need at an accelerated uh, level at the national level, uh, but because of your climate optimism, you're finding uh, a model that can work in the Midwest uh, that I hope we can re replicate elsewhere. Well, I, I know everything feels so hyper-polarized in this moment, but I will also tell you that during the heat of the pandemic, governors were working together. We were sharing best practices. We were trying to help one another, learn from one another. And so we've built some really important relationships that must transcend a pandemic and stay focused on the, the big issues that we're all working to tackle. None of us can do this alone. The future of mobility is not a partisan issue. The American auto industry has been successful because the entire supply chain, right? From manufacturers 
to parts makers, to components. And the industrial strength of the Midwest stretches to every state in the Midwest. Our electricity and transportation don't stop at the state line and neither does our collaboration. We need connected systems. We got to coordinate on large transitions and Rev Midwest will create a connective system across the Midwest and ensure that states aren't making duplicative investments as it relates to our charging network. Mm -hmm. Climate change can't stop at state lines either. Clean energy action is, um, is in any state. It helps every state, but inaction harms everyone too. So that's why it's gotta be a group effort. And um, as, as all states in this part of the country understand how crucial the Great Lakes are, we do have maybe a heightened sensitivity to why, what, what's happening in climate and why it's so crucial that we are solving problems and, and working together to do it. That's, that's just powerful leadership, Governor. You know, Gov Governor, I wanna ask you a question about, uh, you, you noted uh, planning for the future of the workforce, workforce uh, development uh, and training. Uh, and for me, that harkens back to a moment that I had when I was fortunate enough to serve in President Obama's White House. And uh, I remember one late weekend evening when a number of us on the senior staff gathered in the Oval Office to tell the president that we thought he had to make a decision as to whether or not uh, he thought we had to bail out uh, the big, big auto um, companies. And the president looked at us, didn't hesitate and said, you know, you all are coming at this the wrong way. We're not bailing out big auto uh, and big business. What we're doing uh, is rescuing the American middle class. He looked at us and said, you have to understand that without the automobile uh, industry and the supply uh, side uh, demands throughout the Midwest, we would not have ever had a vibrant and sustainable middle class in this country. So we're gonna make this investment and this bet uh, not on their CEOs, uh, but on those workers uh, and on that American middle class. As you've taken up this vision of a clean energy uh, transition on electric vehicles, uh, you have centered uh, workers uh, in that vision because you know better than uh, anyone uh, what role they play uh, in the economy in your state and in your region. I want us all to be able to sit, Governor, in your vision for the future of not only the industry, but also those workers as we move towards electrification. Can you help us understand their, their vitality, their essentiality, and how your administration has worked with both industry and uh, organized labor uh, to uh, stand up some scaffolding around those workers? Yeah, well, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate the focus on the workforce because of course, you know, this auto industry that we are so proud and grateful to be home to did create the, the middle class in America, which, you know, impacted middle class across the globe. And it's something we're very proud of. It's also something we have to be um, uh, strategic about protecting as an industry evolves, as the science evolves, we need to ensure that our workforce is in a strong position to both enhance the skills that are necessary in the advanced mobility opportunities, as well as um, that we protect you know, their ability to collectively bargain and ensure that they get continued uh, you know, wage that can sustain a family and, and create a good life. That's, that's the wonderful story of the, you know, especially UAW, but organized labor across the country. So the future of mobility and electrification is really exciting. It also creates a lot of opportunity as well as lots of challenges. So we've been focused on getting companies to locate and expand in Michigan um, as we attract more talent and create thousands of, of new good paying jobs. We're working directly with our auto companies and suppliers to make sure that they're planning early to anticipate the transition needs of their incumbent workers. Um, transitions are scary. And there are a lot of folks that have been building these cutting edge um, mobility um, uh, you know, cars and, and trucks and, you know, all sorts of transportation solutions. And yet we're seeing how the industry is changing quickly. And that's why it's important that we also give our workforce the tools they need to grow. Investing in training and workforce development programs from pre-apprenticeships with our union partners to advanced high tech degrees at our greater um, higher education institutions is, is absolutely an essential part of our transition that makes 
an opportunity for everyone to move forward. So I've also signed bipartisan economic development bills so that Michigan can compete for advanced mobility jobs, including General Motors $7 billion investment that they have made here in Michigan. We're building EV pickups and battery cell plants, and we need the high caliber workforce that can service, build, and maintain all of these advanced mobility um, offerings. And so we always have an eye toward the workforce. How do we lure more people into this space and how do we ensure that the workforce that is there can transition as the, um, as the, you know, as mobility is transitioning as well. Thank you, Governor. Governor, one of the things that uh, some of us most appreciated about you, uh, both when you ran uh, for office uh, and through uh, your years uh, in uh, the Capitol is you've maintained a clear, sober, plain spoken focus uh, on building the roads, uh, but you've also maintained your gaze on justice. And I wanna to turn to the question of justice for a moment if we can, Governor. Uh, the state of Michigan has had some real uh, challenges around environmental justice. Uh, I wonder how you've experienced those, uh, how you've addressed them, and what is it about the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law uh, that you believe will enable you and your state to make uh, progress specifically on, a, uh, on environmental justice? Yeah, well, thank you, Patrick. You know, uh, people often ask why I jumped into this race in the first place. And I think that the Flint water crisis was maybe one of the most salient reasons. I saw uh, where government fell short and where people were hurt and why it was so crucial that we restore um, integrity and governance that is really focused on people first, not bottom lines, not um, politics, but focusing on people. We've created um, a, a number of things since I took office with an eye toward um, environmental justice and with an eye toward ensuring that we're leveling the playing field and creating a real opportunity for everyone. Um, we've set up processes to ensure that we're hearing from our envi environmental justice community. I created an environmental justice public advocate as well as a clean water advocate an advisory council on environmental justice or for me in the executive office, as well as an interagency environmental justice team. We've launched um, also a tool focused in this space to help identify and address places where residents are disproportionately impacted by environmental hazards. And water quality challenges and unequitable green spaces is something that we're staying focused on as well. With the ARP and the IAJA, dollars um, helped us make historic investments in Michigan that I've worked with the legislature to invest in water infrastructure in parks and in trails. When I took office, I sat down with my director of um, natural resources and he was boasting how we have uh, state parks in 82 counties. And that's fantastic. However, as governor, I know we have 83 counties. So my first question was, why, what, what county doesn't have a state park? And Ironically, it was Genesee County, which is where Flint, Michigan is. We've remedied that. We now have a state park in all 83 counties because having a clean um, place to enjoy the outdoors and to get exercise and fresh air is important in every single community. We've also gotten the Building Michigan Together plan done. It's a 15 times the annual water and in infrastructure investment. Really excited and proud about that. It's gonna give us the ability to move fast and we've made the single largest investment in parks in our state history, um, including that state park that I just referred to in Genesee County in Flint, uh, but also urban greenways in Detroit and Grand Rapids. And finally, uh, we used uh, utilizing Justice 40 to ensure investments in water and climate center on under invest invested communities. So we've got a real eye toward um, equity in, in all things that we're doing, but when it comes to uh, where we're spending our, our precious resources. It is to level playing fields. It is to address in, inequality and inequitable opportunity. And that's um, where we've centered a lot of our work. Um, go Governor, I th thank you for centering uh, open spaces and parks and green spaces, particularly uh, in, in some of our uh, dense urban uh, metros. We discover, of course, during the pandemic that the inability to have those kinds of spaces available in community uh, exacerbated the challenges that we had 
uh, with the pandemic in its early days. So thank you so very much for bringing all of these issues uh, together for us. So I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you, Governor, to take us into the future. I'm, I'm struck by your use of the, the term uh, climate optimist. I think I'm gonna start producing t-shirts that say that and get them out, all, all out across America. Uh, but I'm gonna take you up on the notion of what it means to be a climate optimist, Governor, and ask you, uh, as, as we close our conversation, to do two things, if you would. One is to project out into the future what Michigan uh, will look like uh, five, 10 years uh, from now as we enact these policies and what communities are gonna experience and, and, and what they are going to feel as a consequence, both of your climate optimism and the very practical uh, decisions that you're making about investments. Uh, and then if you would, and I think this is uh, really useful for, for folks around the country, you know, um, you noted before that Michigan has a uh, divided government. Uh, we obviously have, have all kinds of challenges across the country, but it strikes me that even though you have a divided government in Michigan, you don't have a divided people around these issues. You're able to find common enterprise. So in this moment of heightened polarization, what is it that those of us who, can, who are concerned about climate issues should understand about what's available to us in conversation uh, with uh, people uh, in community who seem different, but at the end of the day, have so many uh, similar uh, aspirations uh, for themselves. So if you, if you could take on both of those and weave them together, that would be really, I think, powerful and useful. I'll do my best, Patrick. <laughs> so, you know, I, I am- a Your best optimist. is always the best, Governor. <laughs> well, I, I am a climate optimist. You know, this is a big challenge that requires that we work together. Climate change is going to impact every single one of us. In fact, it already is. Friday night, I took a last minute trip up to Gaylord, Michigan. We had a tornado touchdown. Never has happened before. Two fatalities, a town decimated. And it's only the most recent severe um, environmental, uh, uh, you know, disaster. And so this is something that we have to tackle. We have to address together. And depending on who we're working with or who we're speaking with, um, certainly there are different aspects to it that call different mindsets into this fight. As we think about our economy, ensuring that we've got uh, robust uh, investment in this space, creating good paying jobs is a powerful message with some people who maybe aren't as compelled by the science around climate, but see an opportunity in the, the economic space. Certainly there are allies who are environmental justice warriors that um, are passionate about this work because of the environmental uh, justice, uh, you know, um, urgency. And so I think that as we try to focus around mobility and electrification, those are, those are critical components to our success in this space. You know, our auto industry is stepping up the American auto industry is leading in this space now. It, you know, some perhaps wanted to see it happen faster, but man, they are moving fast now. And it's really exciting. We've added 21,600 auto jobs um, in this space since I took office. And we see a lot more opportunity here. And our workers are benefiting too, right? Um, it, whether it's the workers on the line in the new battery, battery plants and EV plants, um, or it is all of the OEMs or the clean energy jobs and, and the HVAC jobs. This really is um, a, a chance for us to do a lot of good. So I think what does Michigan look like in five, 10 years? My hope and, and belief is that people are going to be pointing to us as the place that is, is innovating solutions, that is solving the homeland security issues of what happens when chips are, are built around the world and our economy shuts down, but also um, solving the problems that we're confronting as, um, as we see this climate changing and, and making a, a real difference. So, you know, our kids give me hope. They're leading the charge, driving change, making their voices heard, um, and knowing that a generation as determined as theirs and, and of innovative Michiganders is stepping to the plate keeps me focused and optimistic. Uh, I would say pragmatic too. We, you know, optimism is an important quality understanding how to get things done is absolutely crucial. And that's why I appreciate the work that you're doing at Center for American Progress and your partnership with the work we're doing. 
Well, Governor, we appreciate you. Thank you for your thoughtfulness, but thank you also for your urgency in, in the moment where we have to make this uh, transition to a cleaner economy, but, but, but doing it in a way that lowers costs for families, supports uh, businesses, and builds the resilience of the middle class uh, into the future. So thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for your vision. We appreciate you, Governor. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, everybody. Take care. I'm gonna now bring in Sam Ricketts, our Senior Fellow for Energy and Environment here at the Center for American Progress. Sam will introduce our panelists and extend our conversation on climate, uh, on jobs, uh, and on justice. Sam previously served as Climate Director for the presidential campaign of Washington Governor Jay Inslee. He served as an advisor to the Governor of Democrat, to, sorry, to, at the um, Democratic Governors Association. And he now also serves as co-founder of Evergreen, an organization deploying policy, communications, and organizing tools in service of the climate movement. Sam, the baton is in your hands. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, thanks for the introduction here. Uh, thanks to Governor Whitmer for joining you for that great engaging conversation. And thanks also to advisor Gina McCarthy for joining us to share some remarks at, at the top of the event. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, I'm gonna lead a discussion here with three distinguished panelists on the opportunities and the challenges that lie ahead in, in decarbonizing transportation, including the importance of high quality union jobs in the transition to electric vehicles, building inclusive adoption of emissions-free mobility options and, and building clean transportation solutions at the local level with meaningful community involvement for, from all stakeholders. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. And when I do, panelists, please feel free to bring our, your videos online. Uh, we'll then launch into questions, um, after which time there should be some space to open up to, for, to a couple of questions from the audience as well. So if you're out there and, and you wanna submit a question for consideration, please use the Q&A feature here on Zoom there's a question you'd like to ask. Okay, so now to our panelists. Uh, first up, uh, Cindy Estrada is the Vice President of the International Union of United Automobile, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, better known as the United Auto Workers or UAW. She is serving in her uh, third four-year term in this elected position within the union and currently head the Stellantis Organizing and Women's Departments. She holds responsibility for both existing and for future members, and she's assembled a multiple, excuse me, multidisciplinary team to focus on the electric vehicle transition. Uh, in her time at UAW, Cindy ran the Michigan Organizing Center, the National Organizing Department. She became the first woman and first Latina to lead the union's General Motors Department. She also led negotiations for the Michigan Coalition of State Employees, providing historic agreements protecting healthcare and workplace democracy, and and before, before joining UAW, Cindy earned a degree at the University of Michigan and spent time organizing with the United Farm Workers. Uh, next up as well, we have Carolina Martinez, who is a climate justice director with the Environmental Health Coalition. Uh, Carolina works with residents in low-income communities and communities of color to advocate for light, climate and land use policies that respect their priorities, improve health, and are consistent with environmental justice principles. Currently, she's working on a community-led effort to transform the San Diego region's transit system into one that feeds the region's livelihoods, reduces air pollution, and threads communities together via the San Diego Transportation Equity Working Group and the 10 Transit Lifelines. Carolina is a proud Colombian immigrant who enjoys working the intersection of liberation, race, culture, gender, civic engagement, environmental issues, health, and city planning in the struggle for environmental justice. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have Terry Travis, who is the managing partner at EV Noir, which works at the intersection of transportation, energy, environmental health, and equity. Terry has worked diligently to engage diverse stakeholders and disadvantaged communities in the areas of mobility and clean and sustainable energy platforms, as well as highlighting the financial and public benefits of the transition to next generation zero emission vehicles. Terry's led collaborations with nonprofits, government agencies, public health groups, regional and national organizations, as well as manufacturers to expand the EV market share. Uh, and he's a, he's a subject matter on these experts, on these, on these topics. He's also a co-founder of the national award-winning organization, EV Hybrid Noir, the nation's first and largest multicultural network of EV drivers and enthusiasts, which serves as a leading voice of this community and in providing education and affordable access to all for next generation vehicles. So please join me in welcoming these three great panelists and in continuing our conversation. And let's dive right into questions. 
Um, first up, I'd love to pose the first question to Cindy to you. Um, UAW members have have for decades built the world's leading automobiles and good paying careers. And the auto industry is increasingly moving towards electrification as we just heard some discussion of between Patrick and Governor Whitmer. Um, and that presents some new challenges and some new opportunities. And I wanna ask you to opine on those. First though, just some context. Number one, it's, it's well known that electric vehicles have fewer components than traditional combustion vehicles with commensurate fewer labor hours in the supply chain and, and justifiable cause for, for workers and, and time. Um, at the same time with the global market shifting to EVs in some places, uh, faster than here in the U.S., uh, workers and businesses and government leaders have to work together to ensure our auto industry and workers continue to lead the world. So how, how are you and UAW thinking about a future in which uh, we reduce transportation emissions, but we're also protecting, preserving, expanding family-supporting union jobs? Yeah, so, you know, it's exciting. In our, of course, our workers, you know, especially in engine plants have a lot of, um, you know, they're afraid, right? And so we spend a lot of time um, also talking about the importance of, you know, the opportunities, because there are less parts in, you know, when you go to, to the EV, but there's also huge opportunities in terms of retraining, in terms of, um, you know, making sure as these new facilities come in, whether startups or battery plants, that we really have a chance to reimagine the industry. And when I say that as part of what Patrick was talking about, you know, one of the things that we're really helping educate people is that, you know, manufacturing is, you hear a lot, it's, it's the middle-class job. But you know, in and of itself, without a union, that's just not true, right? It, it, they're often low wage jobs. It's the democracy in the workplace and the ability to bargain that. So one is is making sure that as these jobs come into the market, that we're making sure that they're union. And the other is to how do we make sure that we have this opportunity to change emissions, which means healthier communities, but having community at the table as well. I, I think it's really important as, as companies come in to get this right, all stakeholders have to be at the table. So, you know, we have to have corporations at the table and private businesses, and we need the administration and government at the table. We need workers at the table, but workers also who are from that community, not just in those four walls. So that we're really looking at how we address all the issues that happen um, that we can avoid this time. We know how to do it right if we get the right people in the room. So I think it's incredibly exciting, but we have to push for that, right? Um, we have to push to make sure that workers' voices are at the table and the community is at the table. And, and sometimes that's one and the same. I think we say that community is workers, workers are community, but you know, making sure that we honor that um, and we push that. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, next up, Terry, I'd love to pose a question in your direction. Um, it's clear there's a lot of excitement around electrifying transportation, and especially from investors, from legacy automakers, from, from new entrants and startups. Um, but what, in your view, do, do policymakers and businesses need to more deeply consider, perhaps, in order to build an inclusive e-transportation e future? And, and how is EV Noir working to accelerate inclusive e-mobility? Yeah, Sam, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think that there, we're at an inflection point um, in our mobility history. And we're at this inflection point where we have a triple bottom line opportunity and businesses, policymakers, as well as regulators um, need to be all at the table having these conversations in a really succinct way. Um, we have the opportunity to really improve mobility and transportation for communities, public health, and critically important to the Midwest uh, in, in the state of Michigan in particular, is workforce and real economic inclusion that comes along with mobility. As you think about what's happening in Hamtramck with Factory Zero, what's happening with Dearborn, with the F-150 facility, what's happening with the investment in Lansing, we're talking about real jobs that are being created. But the idea is, is that we have to make sure that as this transition and this technology is being introduced, that is inclusive in making sure that just as much as we advance the technology, that all facets of communities have access to it. So that means that folks from Detroit, Grand Rapids, all the way up to the UP um, have access to benefit from this technology in the same real world way. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, Carolina, I'd, I'd love to now pose a question in your direction. Um, We'd love to hear more about your work engaging local community stakeholders in building these transportation solutions. Those who may have smaller platforms than powerful government officials or, or business leaders. Um, 
can you talk about the progress that you all are making in the San Diego region and tell us about the work of the Environmental Health Coalition and, and perhaps even replicable lessons from your efforts organizing in that region for an inclusive transportation future that other communities can consider? Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. And, and it's a little bit weird because we're so far away from Michigan, but I think that this experience applies nationally and we all could relate to the fact that not a lot of our communities, our big cities have a reliable transit system. So we've been working with communities, as mentioned uh, previously, transportation is the biggest, biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our region as well. Only 12% of our low income, uh, only 12% of our low income folks have access to reliable transit and 70. So listen to this, 70% of the jobs are not reachable by transit in our region. So we could flip the economy in our region if we have reliable transit. So we've been working with community members to advance what we call the 10 transit lifelines and you can look it up online. And so the 10 transit lifelines identifies what communities and the grassroots identify as priority. So listen to this, they're basic. Restroom, restroom access in the, in the uh, transit system, bus service that runs every 10 minutes, 24 hour service. Uh, youth opportunity passes, so free transit for youth, heavy infrastructure projects like a new trolley state, uh, a new trolley line, but also the acceleration of the uh, bus uh, electrification in California, we're required to do that by 2040, and we're asking for that to be done by 2030. So if you think about a lot of the asks here, they're pretty basic. Uh, infrastructure improvements that could actually be delivered in the next five years and should so that we could transform the transit system. So um, it's been uh, remarkable. We've been able to advance those in the regional plan that was adopted last December. Um, and now we're working on a measure to fund uh, those improvements. But I think to Cindy's point is that if, when you bring folks that are riding transit to the table, you're able to identify very feasible priorities. Um, because if you're thinking about uh, 24 hour service, bus service every 10 minutes, all of that is very financially feasible. So let me pause right there. Wonderful, thank you, Carolina. Um, I, I'd love to now pose some broader questions to allow any of all three of you to, to chime in um, on some different topics. Number one, uh, the first, we, we just heard some conversation on the bipartisan infrastructure law, and as it relates to um, some of these topics, uh, can you talk about your experience, and, and if there is one, um, uh, of seeing these investments coming into states and communities, and how do you see the bipartisan infrastructure law dovetailing with the need to move forward on uh, transportation decarbonization and, and more uh, transportation and uh, emissions free transportation solutions in communities and but before answering I'd, I'd love to just also put a plug in for there's a um, re report that cap has recently published um, called how states can use the bipartisan infrastructure law to enhance their climate action network efforts that covers transportation and some other areas but dovetails not nicely with this conversation which I'm hoping someone might be able to drop in the chat for attendees uh, here as well but uh, yes again how do you see and do you see the intersection of the of the new bipartisan infrastructure law with your work in communities I mean, I, I can go. I mean, I think I think it's exciting. You know, I'm always I'm I'm one that always wants to point out though the what we have to really keep an eye on. And and for me, when you look at um, you know what what just happened, I'm going to give you an example um, with Oshkosh Defense, where they bid on the first electrical postal vehicle, and um, and you know that's a union workforce, and we instead of it being done in that plant in Wisconsin, they're gonna take it to South Carolina and, and nothing wrong with South Carolina, but it was a way of them for to move away from a union workforce. So we have to be really thoughtful um, as policies are put into place that those policies have high road standards, right? So it's, it's I, I agree, it's, it's an incredible um, opportunity as we try to green the economy, but I think there's still more work. And as we had in Build Back Better, 
to make sure that we don't subsidize an industry, but then subsidize them for union avoidance. Um, we need to make sure that when these you know, companies are coming in, that there is a way for workers to, you know, that, that we're, we're, we're um, incentivizing or we're, we're incentivizing and lifting up high road employers, right? Employers that, you know, do the right thing, employers that have lots of transparency, and I, whether it's their safety record, um, you know, all parts of the manufacturing process. So I, I'm excited about um, the work that we can do around infrastructure, but I'm even more excited for the deeper conversations of how we now implement that on the ground. Yeah, and I would jump in and say, that I echo all of those things. You know, for us, we're in a unique place and space. We work across the country um, on electric connected, shared and autonomous vehicle technology. And for the last, I'd say year plus, we've been working um, and engaged with the White House and other stakeholders on what operationalizing what this looks like. So understanding that if we're talking about 500,000 charging stations deployed across our federal highway system, and then going into cities and communities after that, what does that look like? And that was, as was mentioned earlier, I think by Carolina, it has to be a multimodal approach. And so it's not just about light duty passenger vehicles. This is about everything from micro mobility all the way up to transit and class eight heavy duty vehicles. Because what we know is from the systemic and from the historic and systemic issues that got us here, it's going to take a lot of work to get us out of this. And so the idea is, is that we really have to begin to think about this in a very comprehensive way. And so understanding that the one size fits all model doesn't work. Um, and we're going to have to really begin to educate our policymakers and regulators. Last week, we partnered with a number of uh, Michigan organizations, Clean Fuels and Michigan Environmental Conservatives, to actually facilitate a ride and drive for policymakers in Lansing at state capitol, because we think that it's gonna take all of that and more even to get folks understanding where these opportunities are and how folks and communities can benefit from it. And we really have to prioritize this in a real world way. One of the things that I would also add as we talk about this bipartisan infrastructure law is that we really have to think through what education looks like, um, understanding that, you know, working in, in California is very different than working in Michigan. Um, you know, one of the things, the resources that are available on the Western, on West Coast and Western states is very different, but we can get uh, Michigan and some of the other Midwestern states to that place and space, but we really have to educate not just consumers, but those policymakers, regulators, OEMs, utilities, and all of the facets and, and, and members of the ecosystem to begin to understand what that looks like as well. And that's gonna be critically important as we advance this work. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Terry. Carolina, did you wanna uh, chime in on anything relating to the bipartisan infrastructure law as well? No, okay, that's all right. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, just ask a bit about the work that's been done at the federal level that is now, uh, as the points are being made here, really important to track for its implementation at the ground. Um, so we heard also from National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy about the progress that the administration has been making so far uh, on decarbonizing transportation. And, and it's true that there's been some important progress here, like the Friday announcement on EPA's new clean school bus program that is aimed um, both at, at um, uh, that is aimed at reducing harmful pollution in communities and that affects the climate. Uh, and is driving towards cleaner school buses and, and frankly can support domestic manufacturing of those buses. Um, but McCarthy also touched on Congress's role and frankly the work that's not yet done. Um, and I'd love to pose the question here to you all about, um, about the investments that are still pending in Congress. Uh, it's not yet clear the Congress and the administration can work together before the end of the year to achieve even greater investments in building uh, clean energy and in environmental justice. And what would you say to participants here about those investments, which um, many of which were passed by the House as part of the Build Back Better Act that is no more, but but are still under contemplation in the Senate as part of a budget reconciliation vehicle, again, with many of the, of the investments that would be implicated here in the transportation sector and driving towards vehicle and transportation electrification. Uh, thoughts on the, the importance of investments still pending in Congress? Hey, um, I can speak from the local level. I'm not, I should say uh, and be transparent that I'm not uh, advocating, I'm not in the weeds of advocacy at the national level, a very, very local effort. 
But um, when one thing that I elevate consistently is that if we really, really want to address the climate crisis, we have to address air quality and we ha it has to be led by uh, environmental justice efforts. And the reason why that is, is because the main sources that are causing climate change are in our communities. So if that's not at the table, the solutions that are being advanced are false solutions, are not gonna really uh, deliver uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. So for instance, if we're ignoring black carbon, when it comes to greenhouse gas emission reduction, if we're not creating climate policy that um, prioritizes air quality equally, and I should say that air quality is not a co-benefit of greenhouse gas emissions. Air quality should be part of climate policy at the forefront. Um, so if we really want solutions that are gonna deliver for everyone, that has to be, um, I advance. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to reproduce the cycle of the climate crisis. Yeah, I would jump in and say one of the additional things that to think about is is that where we are, we often think about this from a state level or regional level, but as we move into this global economy, um, you know, there's an there's a we have to have the perspective and the lens that you know, where we are. And when it comes to transportation electrification, um, we are not leading. Um, last week, we also facilitated a conversation or virtual event with the Norwegian government and Norway leads the adoption of electric vehicles across modes. They're at about, you know, 82% in many of the areas. And the idea is, is that there are a lot of lessons and transferable assets to be garnered from those conversations at the global level that can also be drilled down and gone to a localized level as well as Carolina was mentioning, because those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And so the idea is, is that we have to understand where we are from a global sense and from a, through a global lens, as well as looking at this, how can we proactively solve some of these issues? How can we begin to address some of the issues through innovation, through policy, through some of the things that we can learn from partners out there? Like the idea is, is that we're at a, a place where we're seeing $500 billion being invested by the private sector to decarbonize or electrify their brands and offerings. What does that translate to as we move forward in this? How do we begin to operationalize that so that we have and a workforce that can benefit from that, charging infrastructure and accessibility across different modes so that communities are able to benefit as well. You know, I agree with Terry. You know, I, I was thinking this announcement um, that happened around the, uh, you know, the electric bus, it, it's very exciting for us in the UAW because we have two of the largest bus manufacturing with really good high level jobs. And, um, and, it's, and it's exciting, you know, when we talk about the local level, it is in our urban and all of our communities where this is directly going to impact the health of kids. I know in the city of Detroit, right, higher rates of asthma. Um, you know, and I, but, but I want, but one of the things, and I'm going to keep pushing this is that, you know, that's a start, but now how do we dig deeper to make sure in this policy, there's more labor standards there and community standards. I think um, when I look at the manufacturing that came to the city of Detroit, we had a community benefits um, uh, program that, you know, from a ballot proposal, and um, it's not as strong as we want it, but it gives the community that seat at the table. Um, so I just think, in again, going locally, it, there is some great policy that's happening. There's more that needs to happen, but I, I think we have to work really hard and force and challenge ourselves um, how that policy, there, there's making sure that the air we breathe is cleaner, but you can't have a green country if workers are still hurting, communities are still hurting. And I feel like we're not there yet. And I think back to the auto crisis, wow, we were able to get into a room with, with corporate America, with um, the administration and with the unions that were impacted to figure out how to save um, you know, uh, the car companies. How do we all get back in the room now 
in a deeper way. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be challenging to have environmentalists and to have unionists, to have administration and corporations. But if we don't do that, I feel like we're going to piecemeal this and we'll have some good policy come out, but it's not going to go deep enough and it's not going to change for that kid sitting in the city of Detroit that is having to walk by that plant every day. And yeah, the standards are better than other plants, but they're still not good enough, right? Or that kid who's work or is in a rural area driving into a plant where, you know, in, in manufacturing, honestly, we don't have Davis Bacon, right? So it's great that we're building these unions, but we got to figure out what happens once the four walls go up. Because I'm talking to workers in Alabama or in Tennessee that are driving sometimes 100 miles to work. Gas prices are high. And there's still, you know, Western Michigan battery plants are making $20 an hour. That is our engine plants of the future that ha we can't go back. We have to make sure we, we take the standard of over $30 and build upon that with the wages and benefits. So I think, you know, I, I'm just always going to caution. We can't assume these are going to be good jobs. They because we can assume that corporate America is going to use these subsidies to do union avoidance. So I just got it. So it's exciting, but um, and, and, and it's going to be a challenge. But what an opportunity, because I think everyone is talking. We know the vision. We all want the same thing, but it's going to take some work and it's going to take a lot of in the rooms back and forth. But I, I feel like we, that's our challenge. Not just Congress, us. Thank you all three for your for your thoughtful responses there. Cindy, I want to pull out one of the things you just said there. I want to just restate it because that was very powerful. It says we can't have a green economy if workers are hurting and if communities are hurting. I just thought that was, that was well put. Um, thank you all for your thoughtful responses to that question. Uh, uh, picking up on this thread about how it, it's not just Congress. Congress has to act. There's more for it to do. Obviously, the administration has to continue their leadership and driving forward on this front. But uh, we've started this conversation with Governor Whitmer talking about her state's leadership. Um, you've all been talking about some of these issues at the local community level, the need for following investments all the way down to companies and to communities. Um, can you talk about, again, I can I ask you all about the importance of state governments playing a leadership role in driving forward this, this, this healthier future for in, in a vision for transportation, both for air pollution reductions, climate pollution reductions, uh, good jobs, uh, health and equity in communities. The importance of, you know, not just the federal government in Washington, DC, but the importance of state leadership playing a leading role here, uh, taking advantage of new federal dollars, but also themselves bringing forward their own investments and their own policies to realize a better future. Anyone like to go first to talk about the importance of state governments? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think that we have a really good model um, to follow. I think that if we just look at what uh, California is doing uh, with California Air Resources Board and the different air districts, we work uh, pretty closely with CARB on a number of initiatives and the governor's office there. And I would say that um, there's some really good models out there as we look about uh, carbon reduction and how we're looking to um, improve air quality across the state. Um, there are some programs that have been implemented that we are you know, um, working on with those partners. And I think that if we use those models, obviously there'll be different variables for different parts of the country, but I think it's a good model to use to work off of, you know, California um, has been, you know, out of the top 10 cities for poor air quality, seven are in the state of California. So folks think about and ask these questions why California leads these conversations, that's why. So if you think about what's happening in San Joaquin Valley, and you think about what's happening in Flint, Dearborn, Indianapolis, Cleveland, some of the other markets that are in the Midwest, there are some very transferable assets and some very transferable skill sets and policy that I think can be implemented as we see this rollout of, of funding that's going to come from the federal government down the states. Um, those state DOTs are going to be really charged, and it's going to be critically important that they are well prepared to actually begin to accelerate this adoption in a real you know, uh, seamless way as, as best they can. The idea is, is that we do have models out there um, that I think, you know, folks can play off of and, 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 and glean from. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for mentioning that. And I, I should elevate that I'm, I'm honored to be working with one of the CART member, uh, board members. 
Um, and I should say that a lot of the uh, shifting on air quality policy has been community led. Um, and so elevating how important it is to center the voices that are most impacted in the decision making rule, uh, room so that we could actually create policy that is uh, that delivers solutions and um, and so more specifically in the transportation world here in San Diego, um, we had we had an agency, a, a metropolitan uh, planning organization that had, had that has a legacy of disinvesting in, in uh, transit for decades. Um, and it wasn't until uh, we had a legislation at the state level that mandated the local, to shift um, the decision-making process that we were able to, uh, to uh, redefine where the future of transportation is going in in San Diego. And this is about 2017 with AB 805 that was authored by, at the time, Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. So I, I would say that the state has a lot of uh, opportunity in shifting what happens uh, within our local communities, if at the local level we're not finding solutions. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share. And, and since then, we were able to shift the, the board makeup um, in, the, uh, in that regional MPO. And to Terry's point, San Diego is uh, the, the region with the sixth um, worst air um, quality in the United States. Um, and so, um, it's really important to address that. And, and that's why we're, um, we've been able to um, fortunately address some of, some of the necessities, but it, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot more work to be done. And, and Sam, before we um, move, I wanted to, to jump back in really quickly. We developed a, a policy toolkit that really does a lot of that. It looks at how states, as well as the federal government and local cities can begin to accelerate their um, EV adoption. We're working with the 25 largest cities in the country and their EV roadmaps or their mobility roadmaps. And one of the things that came out of this very quickly was the fact that um, many of them, you know, who were in the emerging markets needed a, a, a baseline and place to start. So we developed a toolkit that I just dropped into the chat that I think will be helpful for folks as they begin to think through where to begin and how they should begin to think about um, this situation. So Sam, I, um, you know, I think there's so much uh, emphasis and work that has to go into attract you know, companies to states, right? Um, and I think as we're doing that and after we have to spend a lot more time on really thinking about what are the standards, right? What I see in a lot of policy is what are the standards for employers, you know, um, when they're coming into the state. And, uh, and I can't stress enough of lifting up those community benefits programs. I think the state and the local governments, you know, everyone's afraid of that because it's really easier. Just like, you know, the truth is why some employers don't want unions is because it's just easier to make all the decisions themselves, right? Yet, though, when workers are involved, those decisions are much more powerful and much more impactful and lead to better health and safety, to better quality, which in the end for the customer is right. And I would say also when they're coming in, like these standards, it might be hard to get to them. It might be hard to put community at the table and workers at the table and um, you know, to get to the end result. But then you end up, as Carolina was saying, where we're working together and those fights aren't happening on the back end but we're, you know, we're trying to mitigate some of that and, and discuss it. So to me, the most important thing that we could do is really push our state governments and our local governments um, to not take the easy way out. Um, and, you know, it's not just about getting that company here. It's about what we're doing and recreating and, 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 and doing this differently, right? This is, this is a total transformation. And so we cannot think so narrowly, right? It ain't just about get the employer. It's about how do we change what well, frankly we did not do well leading up to this moment 
Totally, totally. Thank you. Well, that that concludes my uh, my questions for you all. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much for joining this panel. I'd love to give you each just a, a few, maybe 30 seconds to offer up a, a final comment or a thing that you want to make sure the audience participants here remember as they as they leave this conversation, um, possibly you know, thinking about the federal policy opportunities that are inherent in the administration now that are still pending in the Congress that states need to be thinking about or that communities and, and, and employers and workers need to be thinking about across the country. Um, uh, Cindy, maybe I'll turn it back over to you to start. Oh, I have so much, but I'm just going to focus on subsidies. Net, let, let's, let's not allow public dollars to and, and subsidize companies that are going to use that for union avoidance. Um, let's push really hard on companies that do that. Let's reward high road employers and, and really hold the ones that aren't accountable because it's our money that is being used to transform this industry. Thank you, Cindy. Carolina. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us being so far away. Um, thanks to the virtual world for allowing us to do this so easily. Um, I would say that, that it's really important as all this money comes through that community-based organizations are at the forefront of identifying um, and ensuring that this funding, if we're saying 40% of this funding needs to go to environmental justice communities, then we need to know how do we guard that money. Um, and I don't think, I would say that at this point that hasn't happened, um, at least on EHC's end, we were not able to tap into it. So I think that we need to develop mechanisms to guard the funding and ensure it delivers to EJA communities. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, Terry, please. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, going back to my original or earlier point, I think that, you know, we're at an inflection point where, you know, the way that we see mobility and transportation is just going to be inherently different as we move forward. We need to make sure that that is a just transition. We need to make sure that those communities, both, both urban, rural, um, all facets of, you know, cultures and communities have access to this in the same way and are benefiting in that same way. And, you know, as we think through this, there are some models out there. There are some, you know, models uh, you know, domestically as well as internationally that we should be looking at. And we should be leaning into those folks who have been, you know, working into this, working in the space and understand the different facets of it. I think that, you know, we have a huge opportunity in front of us. As I mentioned earlier, we have an investment by the private sector of over 500 billion in just light duty transportation, not to mention what's happening in medium heavy duty class three to class eight space. And so with that being said, the idea is, is that, you know, we could really, and this is a transformative time. We, we've, you know, as a country, we've experienced 100 plus years of habit with fossil fuel, and now we're transitioning out of that. And so there's an opportunity to really, you know, address public health, transportation burden, um, energy independence, local manufacturing, all of those things simultaneously coming together, I think, to benefit communities in a way that we haven't seen uh, before and just looking forward to being on the precipice of all of this transformation. Wonderful, thank you, Terry. Well, well thank you again uh, to Terry, to Cindy, to Carolina for joining us for this conversation. Uh, thank you to Governor Whitmer for joining Patrick for a dialogue in, 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 this, in this event. And thank you for, to National Climate Advisor, Gina McCarthy for kicking us off. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll look, look forward to seeing you again at future CAP events. Thanks everybody, signing off. <laughs>